we have our sacred partitions and our secular yes. partitions, right? So, you know, maybe I, I, uh, I volunteer at church, I sing on the worship team, that's, that's uh, you know, that's a sacred activity, mm-hmm. but, you know, I'm an accountant by day, I do accounts payable for a, you know, for a mortgage company, and that's my secular work, right? right? Uh, or I volunteer in the nursery. I mean, that's what I really do for my sacred calling. You know, I, I lead a Bible study or a small group. That's my sacred work. But, you know, what I do every day to earn a living, that's just secular. And I'm telling you, that is um, that is just flat out bad theology. Yeah. It, it is actually a modern form of ancient Gnosticism. Welcome, welcome. We are here with another episode of the Missional Marketplace podcast. Yes. I am uh, I am Darren, your host or co-host with my uh, lovely brother here, Eric. Eric, how you doing? I'm doing great. Lovely. You've never called me lovely. Lovely, before. lovely. Yes. Uh, you know, sage. I was going to call you short. <laughs> I was going. Yeah, you know, I could have come up with a lot of things, but this is where we landed today. You so. could have. I am lovely enough that we're going to correct a problem from the first <laughs> week and not put my face behind. The microphone. Right. right. So. If you if you've watched with us on YouTube, Eric was hiding behind his microphone last week, but it's a little uh, shy. It's all right. We yeah. we've got it fixed. We're ready to to <laughs> rock and roll. But like I said, this is episode two of the Missional Marketplace podcast. So we're learning a few things. We're getting we are. in the flow, getting it ready to rock and roll. But um, yeah, last week we we kind of set the stage a little bit yep. with our uh, our our very first episode. And uh, we let everybody know that that we have this lovely book written by a great author here, <laughs> um, the Missional Marketplace book. Free product, product placement here, yes, right? Yes, yes, very much so. But uh, we let everybody know we're going to kind of walk through yeah. uh, some of the content of this book, kind of bring out some of those uh, some of those ideas that you wrestle with and bring to light in the book. And really where we started was with kind of these these big questions that we all kind of wrestle with, whether right. we, we know it or not. So what, right. are, what are some of these questions that you, we outlined uh, last week? Well, I'm just going to read them right off of the back flap of the book. Absolutely. Can, right? so, Absolutely. You know, is there any eternal value to your day job? You know, mm. I think a, a lot of Christians in the marketplace probably wrestle and ask that yeah, question, right? For sure, for sure. Is it possible to find gospel meaning in a quote-unquote secular career? Mm-hmm. You know, and then one I think a, a lot of us wrestled with, if I, if I really love Jesus, shouldn't I just quit my job and go into full-time yeah. ministry, right? right? Isn't that what right. like, people who are really serious about their faith right. do? And then really, how, how does my everyday work have anything to do with God's mission in the world. And so that's kind of what the book's about. And those yeah. are some of the things we're going to talk about, you know, through the course of this first season of right. the Missional Marketplace right. podcast. Yeah. And if you if you missed episode one, you can go back and catch that on YouTube, obviously, or anywhere that you catch your podcasts. Uh, you'll be able to, to find it. Obviously, if you're listening to it, you've already found it. So you know where it's at. But <laughs> that's right. uh, yeah, last week, we kind of outlined those questions. We dove into that from from uh, from that standpoint and, and really let everybody know what this podcast is about and who it's for. Right. So who would you say, Eric, that this podcast is for? If somebody's listening and they don't fall in this in this category, they might just shut it off right now then. So before <laughs> yeah. we dive into our next uh, little point, uh, who is this for? Yeah, I, I think it's really, you know, the, the heart of this is really for marketplace Christians, Christians who, who have uh, a vocation in the marketplace. Yeah. But they're passionate about God's glory in all of the earth. They're passionate about God's global mission in the world, and they want their everyday work lives to have a deeper kingdom connection. You know, mm-hmm. when they go to work every day, they want to know that their work has actually something to do with this grander call mm-hmm. um, and this thing that is is so valuable and important to them and defining to them uh, as followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. I love that, and. It, and uh, this podcast is uh, brought to you by the Stone Table, which <laughs> if, right. you, if you've seen uh, the look around here, uh, you, you know that the logos are at nice product placement we got going on. Uh, That's right. Today. We got so, a little product placement here with the uh, with the Stone Table mugs and the business's mission mugs. Um, yes. So yeah, just letting you know that that's uh, the missional marketplace brought to you by the Stone Table, and, and as Eric just outlined, uh, this is who the podcast is for and who we're. So if you if you're still with us, we're glad that's right. that you are here. And uh, and today we want to dive into the topic of 
the sacred and secular divide. Yeah, sacred versus secular. And uh, and Eric, you tell <laughs> you, you're going to take us back to the the junior high lunchroom a little bit here with this story, uh, which the junior <laughs> high lunchroom is a scary place in general. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but uh, you you brought out this really cool moment that you had that as you look back on junior high. Tell us tell us uh, your lunchroom experience. Well, yeah, I, I kind of call this the parable <laughs> of the lunchroom, and I think really you know if if you went to school in any capacity, you can you can resonate with this, right? Um, so if you remember, you know, uh, those, those lunch trays that oh, we yes. had in, oh, in yes. school, um, you'd go, it, it had the, the little compartment for your Salisbury steak yep. and then yep. it had a little compartment for your mashed potatoes and a little compartment for, uh, your jello, mm -hmm. uh, cubes. And then oh, yeah. it always, it had that little, uh, square with the circle in it where you were supposed to put your milk carton, which was square, which I always yeah, thought was it, odd. It never made sense. Yeah. It never made sense. But, but anyway, <laughs> you know, the, the. The, the the lunch tray was intended to partition our food, right? Correct. Like it was it was intended to partition our food, and and for me, guys, this is really how all food should be served One, in in modern twenty first century uh, uh, life. Yes, you know, uh, because I have uh, a psychological <laughs> disorder. I don't know if you knew this, okay? but I have a psychological disorder. It's called brumotactilophobia. Oh, brumotactilophobia. I try to say that ten times fast. It, it, no doubt, brumotactilophobia is, is the fear of your food touching. Mm. So I don't know if you're out there right now too. and you're listening to this and you have a, a little issue of that as well. But I, 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 it's not. It didn't follow me into to later life. I'm a little more relaxed little, with it. A little right better now, now but, but not yeah. totally. No. Uh, but you know, nothing was worse than when the juice from your green beans would seep into your mashed oh. potatoes. I know it all eventually That's goes gross. to the same place, man. But like, it's it is just not right. I, uh, so. I can't do. It. I can't. I'm with you. It must be running a family <laughs> or something because right. I can't handle it. So I I love those lunch trays. I love those lunch trays because they kept everything kind of nice that and neatly did. partitioned and that separate from one another. Yes. Now now while I I think these lunch trays are amazing for uh, for food consumption. Mm -hmm. They are a horrible analogy for how we think of our everyday lives, but I, yeah. I think there are, yeah. are a huge number of Christians that probably have a little brumotactilophobia when they think about <laughs> when they think about their lives, right? Yeah. Like we have our sacred partitions and our secular yes. partitions, right? So, you know, maybe I I, uh, I volunteer at church, I sing on the worship team. That's that's uh, you know, that's a sacred activity, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm an accountant by day. I do accounts payable for a you know, for a mortgage company, and that's my secular work, right? right? right. Uh, or I volunteer in the nursery. I mean, that's what I really do for my sacred calling. You know, I, I lead a Bible study or a small group. That's my sacred work. But, you know, what I do every day to earn a living, that's just secular. And I'm telling you, that is, um, that is just flat-out bad theology. Yeah. It, it is actually a modern form of ancient Gnosticism. Oh, wow. Right, ancient yeah. the ancient Gnostics believed that that matter was evil and spirit was good, and so they they compartmentalized their lives. And this wow. is actually a heresy that followers of Jesus have been fighting since the first yeah. century, since wow. the since the early church. When you can right? see that play out, you know, I, even as you say that, I'm like, man, I can see how that's even played out in my own life of just wrestling with the, you know, what what is good here and what you know spirit versus what what right. I'm experiencing in life right. now and and. And yeah, like wow, that's a that's insightful. Yeah, and there's this great verse I think that kind of puts it all in context. Colossians one nineteen and twenty. I love this verse, hmm. and I want you to think about uh, your your everyday work um, and your everyday life in in the context of this scripture. Colossians one nineteen and twenty. It says, "For God, in all His fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through Him, God reconciled." everything to himself. Mm -hmm. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth yeah. by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Yeah. Because of Christ's sacrifice, his death and resurrection, everything is being redeemed and reconciled and resurrected, yeah. uh, including, including the work of our hands, including what we do when the alarm clock goes mm -hmm. off, whether we work as a pastor in a church as a missionary on the mission field, yeah. or as an accountant, uh, accounts payable clerk at a yeah. at a mortgage company, yeah. right? All of it is being redeemed and has been redeemed 
God has reconciled everything to himself and made peace with everything in heaven and on earth yeah. by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Well, that, that, that's such a good uh, framing or, or reframing, right, of, of this conversation. Because I, I don't think, you know, if you grew up in church at all, I'm, I'm looking, I'm thinking of it in my own experience, right? But, but if you grew up in church in any way, shape, or form, it was never really, uh, it wasn't necessarily taught to you that way, but it, it was kind of more one of those things that you caught that right. there's this the sacred and there's the sure. secular and there's a divide and you got to make sure that you choose right and and I don't think anybody would say that they you know were teaching that necessarily, but it was definitely kind of just embedded into the culture of the church that we grew uh, grew up in. And, and I know for me, one one way that that really played out as a as a music lover, uh, the 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 Christian music versus the secular music, right? That was one easy way that kind of seeped into the conversation of like, oh, you got to make sure that you're listening to Christian music because all secular music's bad. And and though the the purpose of that conversation was was needed and helpful because I, I think music obviously has a, a, a power on uh, on us and it sure. can it can help us in good ways or bad ways think about the way we view our lives right but I think what it did in a in kind of this underlining way was allowed that to seep into everything yeah. right so if there's Christian music and secular music that means there's uh, Christian work and how secular work. How many albums did you like throw out or oh. burn or break and then buy again? Oh man, there, uh, there, <laughs> there are um, there are artists that literally are are still eating from <laughs> from me paying all of the times that I threw them away and repurchased them. Yeah, we we had a lot of a lot of fun with that. Um, yeah, the the church camps that we grew up in, and you'd you'd come bring your your CDs and put them yeah. in the fire. And I, I still like so, yeah. I, I still mom doesn't like when I tell this story, Dave. Aaron, but I, I still remember mom breaking my Michael Jackson Thriller album oh. into multiple pieces. I'm wondering what that vinyl would be worth, like an original vinyl oh, of Thriller would be worth today. But yeah. it, was, it was apparently giving me nightmares. Um, oh. yeah, yeah, so... Well, um, I guess mom probably did it from the nightmare <laughs> standpoint right. instead of the music standpoint, you know. Uh, but yeah, nonetheless... Point that, taken, yes. That, that could we have forgive you, mom. Yeah. yeah, we forgive you. We love you. Yeah, so. that was our retirement plan that she broke. <laughs> uh, totally, totally back. Fired. That's totally right. Fired. That's right. But uh, spe speaking of church camp, I know that uh, that we grew up going to uh, to a church camp, and, and maybe if you're listening and grew up in the church, you had a similar experience. But yeah. but there is a story that you tell that I think um, shines light on some of these things that we're talking about with the sacred and secular divide. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So Lake Lake Placid Campgrounds in Hartford City, Indiana, mm, um, booming metropolis. There was there. Yeah, Hartford City. I, I don't know how they call that a city because it is not a city at all. Uh, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but awesome, awesome formative yeah. uh, Christian experience, yeah. um, you know, in that place. But one of the things I do remember about Harvard City is the the sulfur level in oh, the water. So you remember bad. that? So Just bad. a little bit. You showered higher, and smelled worse. Higher than normal. So yeah. the whole place had kind of this this odor of rotten eggs. Yeah, it was bad. Um, so after a, you know bad. a day of doing church, you know, games or, yeah. or camp games, you'd come and shower for service, Ugh. and you'd smell worse after uh, after getting ready. It's terrible. Uh, it's terrible. But no, no. Every night of church camp had a theme. You know, so like yeah. the first night of church camp was a a salvation message. Mm -hmm. The second night was about discipleship and sanctification, but it, it always culminated, the week always culminated with called into ministry night. Yep. And I, I remember these things vividly. We actually anticipated them, right? Yeah. It was like yeah. you, you were trying to sense what the Lord might or might not be saying to you over the course of the week because you knew where the culmination <laughs> yeah. was going to come. And, and the evangelist would preach this incredible, powerful message on what it means to be called into yeah. full-time vocational ministry. And then he would say, who here feels like God is calling them into full-time ministry? And, and maybe 10, 12% of the kids would raise their hands, mm -hmm. right? And then he would say, if you feel like you were being called into full-time ministry, then come down to the front here. So all those who felt called yep, would yep. get up from their seats, their, their metal folding chairs, and they would walk to the front <laughs> And they would kneel down, and then the other 90% of us or so would be asked to gather around them, lay hands on them, and pray for those who yeah. were called. 
yeah. who were called. And it was always funny because you, you'd spend the day on the sports field and then you'd get mad at one of the other kids and he would go down to be the called <laughs> ones and you'd always be like, man, I ain't following that guy. <laughs> that's right. He's not going to be the pastor not of going my to his church. church. <laughs> no doubt. No but yeah, doubt. That's, totally, that's totally how it works. Yeah. You know, 10% of the kids go down and we all kind of right. came up. And, and, and you know, I remember after service, you know, you'd be walking over to the snack shop and one of your buddies would holler at you, hey, hey, Eric, were you called? Mm-hmm. Did you get the call, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. And I always remember saying to them, no, no, I, I am, I am yeah. not called into the ministry. I right. am just going just. Yeah. into secular right. work. I like, remember saying that. Yeah, again, not something that was taught, but just this underlining yeah. thing that is, even in that conversation, that innocent conversation with your friend there becomes this these theological, Correct. weighty, heavy thing that you're like, oh, sacred, yeah. secular, and begins to split those things. Yeah, and I, I just want to say this to be clear before we go further, that there is something unique. For sure. And special For about sure. the ecclesiastical, we'll call it the ecclesiastical call into full-time ministry. Right. Please don't misunderstand. This is right. not to, to reduce no. that unique and special calling that it rests on men and women who are called to Correct. minister within Correct. a church context. That is Correct. a special, unique, heavy, um, heavy calling mm-hmm. um, to be called to the mission field. You know, um, That is a unique calling. But what I do want to make sure we don't do is it, it, we, we don't want to press down yep. or devalue yep. pastoral ministry, but I want to elevate and I want people who are in the marketplace to understand if you are a follower of Jesus... Your everyday work has been redeemed by the gospel, and your work redeemed, you know, uh, for God in all his fullness is pleased to live in Christ, and through him God has reconciled everything. Your work, your everyday work is a sacred endeavor. It is a sacred endeavor. It is not a secular endeavor. There is no partitioning, no brumotactilophobia necessary (laughs) here. We don't need to partition our lives. Go ahead and just mix all that stuff together. Uh, like we used to do with my my buddy uh, Todd, uh, we used oh. to be able to pay him to eat anything. We could mix anything together, right? Oh. And we could pay him to eat it. I'm getting um. sick just thinking about that. <laughs> but every every friend group that I, I'm pretty sure that everybody had a friend that was like that. There, there's always I know I had a friend that you could you could dare him if you dared him. Oh, that's all you had to say. I dare you, <laughs> and he was doing it. It didn't matter what it was, and it would often, you know, eat this weird kind of concoction exactly. that we've created. I think we've taken a very beautiful and powerful spiritual moment and just turned it into a, you know, yeah. com- a comedy, totally, uh, totally. A comedy. Scene, That's what so. we do best. Yeah, That's exactly. what we do best. So, yep. yeah. Well, I, I know that it, it would be easy to hear us talk about that and to go, oh, you know, bring down the ministry calling. Uh, instead of what I think we're trying to do, which is really help others and everybody to understand that the work that they do every day is so important to elevate that up and to see that it doesn't matter uh, what your day job looks like. uh, There is a sacred calling in that. And uh, I know that we've all had probably uh, in one way, shape or form, a terrible job. (laughs) And I know that somebody's probably out there sitting at that job, maybe even listening to this podcast to try to get away from it for a minute going, uh, I hate what I do every day. Uh, I know we all have had those. I've had those. You've had those. So uh, to maybe set set it up, what what's the worst job you've 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 had? Oh man, um, you've probably had a few, but but what comes to mind is one of the the worst ones that you had. Yeah, well, I think one of the ones that that always comes to mind. You know, I, I worked for a CPA firm uh, right when I got out of college uh, for for two busy seasons, and I remember. Um, one of our first jobs was to do an inventory count. Mm. And uh, we had to do an inventory count Sounds at a big manufacturing fun. plant up in northern Indiana. And uh, I, I was, of course, I was the new guy. You know, I was 22, 23 years old, had no clue what I was doing. So they put me out in this freezing cold warehouse, put me on a scissor lift. I remember being like three like three stories up on oh, this scissor man. lift. Which you're kind of scared of heights too, so that really yeah, freaks exactly. you out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so and and I had to do we we had to do sample counts of I, I don't even remember what it was some widget some part oh, that they man. made in, at this manufacturing company and so all day long in fact it was Christmas Eve I'll never it was Christmas Eve because you oh, have wow. to do these like right up against the the end of the year you have to do oh. them as close to the end of the year as possible and so I remember doing these inventory counts taking a widget out of one box you know, uh, putting a check mark on a piece of paper, put it in another box, <laughs> freezing to death in this warehouse, right, on Christmas Eve. Oh, man. And thinking, 
you know, if somebody would have told me that was a, a sacred calling right, at that right. point in time, I would have told them they were absolutely right. nuts, right? But I think we have to learn to rethink our work through, and we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, and we're yeah. really going to unpack this more in the coming yeah. weeks. But even the simple service acts, right, we can connect them to how how work that we might see as awful, how work we might see as menial, how work we might see as not feeding our our egos or, or right, being able to connect right. it to something greater something than ourselves, bigger. right? Yeah, like yeah. If, if we can go back and say, look, how does this ultimately add value to human lives and to other people? We can realize that yeah. it is a sacred calling and endeavor. So I wish someone yeah. would have helped me connect the dots between an, an inventory count on Christmas Eve in a freezing cold warehouse and the impact that that manufacturing company was making ultimately yeah. on the lives of everyday people yeah. through what they created and manufactured that helped people flourish and live their lives. For sure. Right? Because I think there's some jobs that it's easy to, to make that dot connect, right? right? It's easy to go, this is how my work ultimately helps this company do this good in the world, right? But there are other jobs that are a little more difficult, right? right? A little bit more like, oh, they just feel like kind of meaningless or or yep. just like, I, I can't see how this actually makes an impact. Yep. And uh, and I want you to tell the the story. I, I hope I'm not ruining a, a podcast down the down the way here. <laughs> but you had an encounter with with somebody in in, in the airport mm. that was uh, just somebody that was just cleaning up around. That's right. And had this amazing experience where she just had she had connected the dots and something that we might easily overlook. Yeah. But but she was able to go, no, this this actually has meaning and impact. And, and maybe unfold that story if I haven't ruined a, a, a later podcast <laughs> you, story. You've gone in, off script way, and so. now we've ruined the rest of the season. But <laughs> no, no, that is a, a great story. It's a powerful story. Um, and we may just tell it again in a few right, episodes. Right, for but sure. Yeah, flying back from L.A. to uh, to Indianapolis uh, from a business meeting one time, and we, we were coming through the Atlanta airport, and it was it was late. I mean, it was late. Mm. I mean, it was the last flight. I think it left at like 11.30, got back to India about 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we were sitting at, uh, at gate B26 in the Atlanta airport. I still, when I when I go to the Atlanta airport now and I walk by, yeah. I go, that's, that's yeah. where this happened, still, right? Yeah, we were good. We were dead tired. A couple other guys were traveling with me, and we were watching the the last minutes of like the, the West Coast NBA game right. that was up on the terminal screen. <laughs> And uh, there was no one in the airport. And if you've ever been to the Atlanta airport, I mean, there's never no one in the Atlanta airport. That's yeah, how late this yeah, was. That's a... And uh, we were sitting there, had our feet up on the seat, had our roller bag luggage. And, and all of a sudden, I hear this humming and singing. And, and I look up, and, the, and this lady is pushing the, the janitor cart. Yeah. And uh, she, is, she, is, she is happy. She is singing. And uh, she she comes right up to us, and I, I stop and I say, "Hey, are we are we in your way? Do you need to come right, through here?" Right, right. She's like, "Oh, sweetheart, no, no way. You just sit right there. You let me take care of things, right?" Oh, wow. So it started a conversation, yeah, uh, with her, and we found out that earlier that day she had found she she was telling us she found somebody's luggage. Somebody had left mm. their 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 carry on luggage, and she had taken it to Lost and Found, but she was so worried that oh, it may just get lost in the system here, yeah. <laughs> that, that she, she found their business card. She Googled the person's oh, wow. name and somehow found <laughs> their email or their, their contact information. She called the person on the phone, right? Wow. She's probably making minimum wage, sweeping floors, mopping floors, yeah. picking up trash. Easy to say that's not my job. Exactly. But she, she was such a breath of fresh air. She yeah. kind of, she, after she had picked up around us, she walked off down the hall and I, I actually chased her down, I yeah. chased her down the, the corridor, scared the living daylights out of her. But I, I touched her on the shoulder and she had earphones in and she pulled them out. And I said, I, I, said, I just got to tell you, you have blessed us tonight. Yeah. Like you, you have blown us away yeah with your grace. And I, mm. I said, I want you to know that what you do sweeping floors here at the Atlanta airport, yeah. that is a sacred thing. You added value to our lives tonight. You, you in a way, whether you knew it or not, pointed us to something greater than ourselves, yeah. just through the way you embraced your job yeah. and served us and, and washed feet the way Jesus would wash feet. Good. So th good. I, I, I love that story because there is no menial job. There is no menial work when we give it to the Lord yeah. to use for the value and the blessing of right. other other people. Right. When you can say what, you know, not what can I get from it necessarily, but what good can I give? 
and, and you see it in that story in such a beautiful way yeah. that she was like, this is more than just the work that she had to do. There was something bigger. There was something uh, that allowed her to, to really say, I'm going to do this good in the world. It might mean call this guy, Google his name and call yep. this guy, find the luggage. It might mean just being a smile uh, in a, in an enjoyment, you know, when you had that interaction, it, it left you, yeah. um, you know, with a smile on your face too. Yeah. She, she and wasn't saying I'm, I, I'm just, I, I'm just a janitor. Just this, I yeah. just have, yeah. you know, yeah. this, this minimum wage job. She was saying, how can I use what God has put in my hands today yeah. to, to bless others, to honor God yeah. and add value to the lives of people around me. And that's something we're going to talk about a lot in upcoming yeah, episodes. For sure. And so hopefully as you're sitting out there listening to it today, that you, you hear us, um, and, and it's an inspire inspiration to you that you can say maybe if you're not in the 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 job that you love right that you could at least go i i want to do some good in the world and maybe just see that there's not a sacred secular divide there's not this this lowly job that you just have to just do but there's something powerful yeah. uh, when you can allow god to redeem it so step into that today um and, and hopefully that's an encouragement to you. Well, last week we introduced a uh, what we're calling a missional moment, where we we highlight somebody maybe that we know or have heard of that that is just stepping out and doing some some good in the world. They, they might be a missionary, they might be a business leader, they might be somebody that we've just heard their story. Uh, if we could get that lady that you <laughs> that you yeah. saw in the airport, it would be awesome to have that conversation. But but it's our missional moment, just a, a short story about how people are stepping into the world and allowing their work uh, to, to reach all around the world. And so let's, let's step into our second missional moment. For this week's missional moment, we're going to talk to my good friend, Amy. Amy and I grew up together, went to high school together, we're in church youth group together, and now for almost two decades, Amy and her family have lived in Southeast Asia doing some incredible work. But it wasn't always that way. Um, when, when Amy and her husband first landed there in Southeast Asia, her husband began to do uh, more traditional work in the area and was having some, some good impact uh, with what they were there to accomplish. But Amy was, she was frustrated. She was struggling to, to find her place and to make connections with the women in the community. And that's when, growing up as the daughter of a businessman, an entrepreneur, she started toying with ways that maybe business and business's mission could help her connect and make an impact on the local women in the community where they lived. And that's what started her business called Remade. I'm gonna let Amy tell you about it. We uh, take old saris, which a sari is a, the dress the Indian ladies wear. And it's just six feet of material. There's no sleeves in it, there's no hems, there's nothing in it, it's just a piece of material. And we take old ones and we repurpose them into different things like blankets, bags, scarves, all kinds of different things. Like all good businesses, businesses mission projects start with identifying a local need. You know, we, we always think of missions through charitable lenses, but businesses mission actually looks at meeting a local need in the community through marketplace and commerce. I would walk through our, the village that we are a part of and I would see little girls out and I would say, well, why aren't you in school today? Oh, we can't afford a book bag, so I can't go to school. If I go to school without a book bag, my teacher will scold me. Mm. I mean, just me, the way I'm wired, the injustice of that just lit me up. You know, it just, that's not okay that a girl or a boy or anyone doesn't go to school because they can't have a book bag. You know, as believers in Jesus, we believe everyone was created in the image of God. Uh, the theological term is the Imago Dei, that all of us have that imaging or that reflection capability that's been stamped on us directly by God Almighty. And that's why when we look at what Amy has done through Remade, we see that she has identified the value, the human value in each of the women that are part of the Remade business. But she's also looked at their gifts and their talents and their unique abilities and said, how can those unique abilities, that unique stamping of God on the individual lives of these women meet the need that she identified in the local community? In that village, there was one thing that a lot of them were good at, and that was the sewing. And when I identified that, I realized, like, this is something. This is something that they 
can bring the value that they have, the skill that they already have obtained, bring that to the business. Yeah. We can improve on it and then they can find value in that work when they see these things So, You know, after years of running these remade centers, Amy has countless stories of life transformation. You know, this part of the world is not known for women being empowered financially or in many other ways. And so through their involvement with Remade, many of these women now, they're able to, to save money. They're able to buy things they would never be able to buy for themselves. They're able to invest in their children and in their families. And it, it really has raised the dignity level in, in ways that these women never thought was possible. So I'm gonna let Amy tell you one such story. Well, I walked outside with her and we walked up to this brand new scooter. And I'm looking at it and she just stayed there with this gigantic smile on her face. And I finally realized like, she's not saying a word to me, but she's standing by this brand new scooter. And I said, Holly, is this yours? Is this your scooter? And she said, yes, auntie, it's mine. I bought it last month. I saved all my money for the past six months that I earned and I bought this scooter. And I fell apart. I was yeah. so shocked. I'm expecting something small. And she has a scooter now. And she flies all over that village to this day with her son on the back, taking him to school, all kinds of stuff. It's so fun to see. It is fun to see. But you know, what makes business as mission unique and really any kingdom business initiative unique is what we call a multiple bottom line approach. You see, yes, we want our business to, to meet a local need. We want it to harness value and connect dots. And from an economic standpoint, we want the business to be in the black, right? We want it to be economically viable and uh, to do well on traditional business terms. But when we're talking business as mission, that's not the only bottom line that we care about. See, there's the spiritual bottom line as well. I feel like we do have two bottom lines and we have the business yeah. bottom line, which is like the profitability, all those things you get taught in business school. But right. you also have the spiritual bottom line. You have the holistic bottom line, which if I have to choose every day of the week, the holistic bottom line is going to win out. You know, even if what we're doing holistically doesn't make business sense. Well, God makes up that difference and I'm not going to discount God. You know, he's able to make up that difference every single time. And I've seen him do it multitude of times. You know, and what I would say to you, if you are a believer who works in the marketplace, if you are a believer that has marketplace skills, I want you to know that who you are and how God made you is part of God's kingdom plan for the world. Your work, your giftings, your wiring is sacred. It's sacred. It's not secular, it's sacred. And I wanna let Amy just encourage you a little bit about how your gifts can be used for the glory of God amongst every nation, tribe, and tongue. I mean, I would say, first of all, just be obedient to God. He is going, you just do and learn most, the most about the giftings that you have. Whatever giftings God has given you, you do the best you can in school, you learn about it, and leave it up to God as to how he's gonna use that in your life, because he will. That's not a concern. Like God will use the stuff that you're good at because he's given you those abilities. So he's not going to waste it. So I wouldn't concern myself with that as much as finding ways to be better at those things, to find ways to enhance those giftings, you know, whatever it might be. Huge thanks to my friend Amy and her incredible work at Remade, harnessing the marketplace for the mission of God in the world. If you're interested in learning more about Remade, you can go to RemadeIndia.com. That's RemadeIndia.com. And you can find out all about the incredible work they're doing there in Southeast Asia. Well, it's officially episode two in the books. Right. We did it. Two we down. With two down. Thanks to Amy for the missional moment. Uh, I love that story. I love hearing incredible. what's happening all around the world. Uh, and Eric, this is a resource that we're creating, uh, but it's not the only resource we have. What, where can uh, can everybody find more resources just like this if they would like? Yeah, well, we would love, I mean, first and foremost, we would love what, wherever you're listening to this podcast right now, if you would like, like it, mm. um, that really helps uh, kind of establish yep. it, uh, as a, it as a podcast. It, yeah, kind of rate stuff. it, review it, share it, uh, send it to somebody that you think might uh, benefit from yeah. Uh, the topic, but you know, we, we do have a lot of resources, a lot of free resources. If you go to the stonetable.org, our resource page there, there's blogs, articles, videos. Yeah. Those videos also show up on our Instagram page, yep. they show up on our Facebook page. Yep. We're also on LinkedIn at the Stone Table. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, we've got the book. 
um, if I can do a shameless plug yeah, for, uh, sure. for the book. Plug but, away. Uh, yeah, you can, you can find this uh, at the resource page at thestonetable.org. In fact, I think there's a little banner that pops up on the, on the top bar when you go to yes. stonetable.org yes. where you can Absolutely. order this. It's on Amazon. Uh, you can also go to ericcooper.me, Eric with a K, um, and you can order it there. We've got it. Uh, we've got uh, paperbacks. We've got um, uh, digital eBooks. Yes. And we've also yeah. got the audio book. So like if you want oh, me to yeah. read it to you, like yeah. I can read it to you yeah. as well. Maybe put you to sleep at night, <laughs> put your kids to sleep at night. Yeah. Um, but we would love for, for you to connect with us. And uh, we really... More than what we can get from you, we really just want this to be a blessing to you. We want this to help reframe your everyday work, maybe encourage you a little bit um, uh, when that alarm clock goes off tomorrow morning that you would feel that invigoration that, that yeah. says, hey, I actually have a sacred calling here. Yeah. Uh, whatever my everyday work is, uh, it has been redeemed and resurrected by Jesus Christ. So I hope That's you come good. back and join us the next time. Darren, mm -hmm. thanks for uh, for hosting us again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll see you here next week for another episode of the Missional Marketplace podcast. Mm -hmm.